very good morning, everyone. Welcome to ISG master class. As you are aware that during this period of lockdown, we have initiated a uh, learning activity of uh, ISG where we conduct a master class uh, twice a week, Wednesday and Sunday. And on this learning activity of uh, ISG, In, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, food uh, program of IGC Masterclass, we have a very important topic and we believe uh, this is extremely important for young training gastroenterologists and uh, even for senior gastroenterologists. What are the basics of uh, endoscopy training? What are the basic skills which one must know to become a good endoscopist? Masterclass twice a week. Wednesday and Sunday. So, so for this, we have a, one of the most uh, renowned endoscopists of, uh, uh, of the world. Uh, and uh, and Dr. Dr. D. and Lady uh, to speak to us on uh, this topic. Uh, he will speak to us on uh, what are the basic skips, uh, which skills for 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 industry learning, and he, he will provide some tips. With this, I invite Dr. Saraswat uh, to welcome him, and uh, uh, then we go to his uh, lecture. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be back on the ISG Masterclass uh, today with uh, Professor D. Uh, N. Reddy talking to us about the topic that uh, Govind has elaborated: learning endoscopic skills for uh, beginners. Um, the, uh, this is the fourth in the series of ISG masterclasses and uh, I'm happy to uh, say that there has been quite enthusiastic participation from India as well as uh, from our neighboring countries. And in the last session, we had over about 240 people logged in from Nepal and Bangladesh. Today, we are expecting uh, uh, participants from Pakistan as well as Myanmar along with the other countries to uh, chip in. And... Uh, continue with this series. As you know, the format will be that uh, Dr. Reddy will talk to us for the first uh, 20 minutes or so, and uh, then we'll break for about five minutes to take question. And it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, the past president of ISG with us, who will be moderating that segment of the session. Subsequently, whatever other questions that uh, remain, we'll try and take as many as possible at the end of the um, presentation. And as you would be aware, many of you who have sent in questions would have received answers from the ISG Secretariat for the first three talks. So we hope to continue that format and eventually get much of the video as well as the oral presentations onto the ISG website for those who miss the live sessions and as well as for future viewing. So with these few words, I uh, request uh, Professor Reddy to begin uh, with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Vivek Saraswat and Dr. Govind Makaria for giving me this opportunity in this wonderful platform, which they've created for students to know what's happening in the field of uh, different areas of gastroenterology. Uh, it's also a privilege to have Dr. Ajay Kumar, the past president of uh, ISG, moderating this session. Uh, my topic has been on mantras of learning endoscopy. In fact, uh, Govind told me that, can you just tell some mantras of how young gastroenterologists or those in training should learn endoscopic skills. Um, unfortunately, endoscopy, like uh, what our ancient wishes to have, mantras to uh, put a weapon forward and so on, we don't have a single mantra. As you can see, it's a very structured way of how we learn endoscopy. And what uh, we will do is that I assume that this is going to be for students, those who are learning endoscopy and those who are advancing in their endoscopy career. So it'd be very basic, uh, actually aimed at them. What I'm going to do is address five areas. Who should be taught endoscopy? How should a trainee learn? How to deal with complications? The risks of being endoscopies and some very personal observations on 40 years of being in this area of endoscopy. The first three subjects I'm going to deal first, and then we'll have some question answers followed by the last two ones. Now the first, who should be taught endoscopy? 
this is something that has been debated a lot in literature because if you look at it, it can be basic GI fellows, surgical residents, physicians, and so on. But for the purpose of this talk, I don't want to go into the debate of whether who should be trained, but basically this is aimed at GI fellows and advanced uh, postgraduates who have finished their GI fellowship and want to do an advanced training course. So now, what level of endoscopy and who should train? In fact, if you look at this, basic GI fellows should know how to do standard procedures, GI bleed, polypectomy, dilatation, peg, and so on. So basic gastroscopy, colonoscopy, and this few basic procedures should be part of GI fellowship, three years or whatever it is. Uh, there's some criticism about this. Some of the GI fellows feel that, how come you're not taught ERCP? How come you're not taught EUS? So there's some agitation among them. There can be exceptions, especially if somebody is going to practice in a district area and nobody else to help him. Maybe he should have some skills in ERCP US. But at present all over the world, what is agreed upon is that a GI fellow should have basic skills in endoscopy, colonoscopy. These basic uh, uh, techniques of um, interventional endoscopy and maybe they can have a knowledge of how to pass a side wing endoscope or go up to the papilla, identify the papilla, maybe know how to remove a stent and so on, not beyond that. Again, this is something we can discuss in question answers and debate, but this is the general feeling. Now coming to advanced GI fellows, those who have finished their fellowship program and want to do an advanced procedure, usually they are falling into category of learning ERCP, US, ESD, enteroscopy, third space endoscopy and all. I think this should be reserved for advanced fellows. Unfortunately, in our country, we don't have a system where you have two years of advanced fellowship program and all. But in general, I think when trainers are thinking of training, they should train post GI fellows for these type of procedures to be done. So should a, somebody who's going to take up GI endoscopy, should he be technically competent? In fact, there's a lot of debate again in literature whether if you want to learn GI endoscopy, you should be good at hand-eye coordination, should be a good tennis player, should be good at computers and so on. I personally believe that there is certain advantage of having hand-eye coordination, which is better than average, but this is not necessarily so. Basically, I think anybody who wants to learn GI endoscopy should have basic knowledge of gastroenterology. So you should be either a gastroenterologist fellow or doing, working in the area of gastroenterology. Of course, for surgeons, it becomes easier to pick up because they're already having a lot of anatomical knowledge. But I believe that even research fellows and, uh, for example, if some gastrointestinal fellow is interested in doing research further on, he should have basic endoscopy skills, endoscopy and colonoscopy. So this is very important. Uh, the reason why this is important is that to a large extent, uh, even for an average person, you can train him with MAC with some amount of uh, manual dexterity. You don't require to be very good at doing procedures uh, to start off itself. Because if you actually look at what are, the, what are the things that an endoscopist does, in fact, if you look at this, the endoscopist has uh, just these 10 procedures. All you do in endoscopy is this 10. Withdraw, pull back, advance, insufflate, aspirate, tip up, tip down, and so on. You just have to take the endoscopy wheel and just do these procedures. This is all you can do. You can't do beyond that. So therefore, this can be easily taught. Excellence uh, is won by training and habituation. People are not born with excellence. This is very important to realize because if you look at the surgical literature, there is a lot of literature suggesting that some people are born with excellent skills. So I think in endoscopy, excellence is art won by training and habituation. And this is important to fellows to remember. There are three types of endoscopic uh, trainings that are uh, what we currently see. One, of course, is the comprehensive structured program that can occur with uh, three-year fellows that normally is done. Second is the short-term programs that are being uh, done. And these short-term programs are usually to learn a particular skill after you learned your endoscopy. For example, if you want to learn advanced polypectomy, if you want to learn certain amount of endoscopic ultrasound, this is for short-term. Very ultra short term for a week and all can be done for new technologies. Suppose you want to learn suturing, how endoscopic suturing. So this is you finish your endoscopy, you just come for a week to a place where suturing is done and learn on animal model. So these are the three things. But in general, uh, if you look at all training courses that are there, curriculums that are there, 
they are very clear that it should be done. Endoscopic training should be done as a part of a three-year program. You can see this. I'll just read this along with you so that successful, this is ASG. Successful trainees in GI endoscopy acquire their skills through a program of hands-on training under mentorship of expert endoscopic trainer that occurs over a prolonged period of time that is represented by a gastroenterology fellowship, usually two to three years. Now, when should, as a fellow, when should you start picking up your endoscope? As soon as you enter the department or at the end in the last year? Again, there's a debate, I think, clear. I would suggest that six months into endoscopy course, after you've finished your six months fellow, then you start thinking of upper J endoscopy first and then colonoscopy and so on. Again, there are no standards set. There are no papers to suggest when, but this is the, what I feel is what should be done. The second thing is the most important thing. How should a trainee learn? Now, a fellow enters into gastroenterology three-year course. He has never touched an endoscope. He's probably seen some procedures being done. He's basically a physician who's not um, used to handling tissues and so on. How should he learn? Now, training for endoscopy has two components. The first component is the technical skills. Now, this is the easier part to learn. And I showed you the 10 technical things that you can do, pushing scores, pulling it out, right and left and so on. This is not difficult. Paradoxically, more difficult to learn is the cognitive skills. Now, what is cognitive skills? Cognitive skills are some of them are easy, like indications for procedure, knowing what complications are. But more important part of the cognitive skills is the image interpretation, which is probably the most difficult part. And intervention, when to get inside. So these are all like knowledge-based wisdom that comes over a period of time. So when you start endoscopy, your cognitive skills are very low. Your technical skills, you can improve rapidly, but it takes a long time for your cognitive skills to come, maybe at least three years before you reasonably develop some amount of important cognitive skills. So therefore, for trainees, again, I want to emphasize, you may be able to go in quickly, go see the papilla and so on. But recognizing the pathology of the papilla, whether it could be an ampullary adenoma, whether there's stone causing this bulge and so on, will take some time. So wait for your cognitive skills. Don't be in a hurry. It takes usually up to three years for you to develop full cognitive skills. So when you train normally, we not only talk about these technical skills that are there, but you talk about image interpretation, when to intervene, what type of therapies can be done. And of course, the easiest part is patient selection and indication, which are very theoretical. So there's a format on how we learn endoscopy. So what we normally do is we would watch, read, perform. So this is uh, how it is goes. So you first read about the literature, then you watch, then you perform. Now, uh, there are many books that are available now in the market which, uh, which you can purchase. The most important of them I'd suggest all of you to do is get this book on gastrointestinal endoscopy. It's a standard classical book which is there, uh, which was initially class and was editor. Now we have new editors. The most common book that we all read was Peter Cotton's book. And this is a must. The, the, I'll show you the latest edition which is there, but this is something that you must all read. It's compulsory for all patients. Very clear, nice descriptions that are done. The others that are there, many, many books are there, but Peter Cotton has actually now improvised on that and uh, come up with this new book on fundamentals, which again, I'd very strongly recommend. Yeah, most of these are, of course, available in your libraries. You can also get them uh, uh, in, um, from, download them from Amazon and so on. So these are the fundamental things that you must read as uh, endoscopies. Now, uh, the second component of learning how to do endoscopy is watching. So first is read and second is watch. Uh, there are two ways of watching endoscopy procedures. One is going to large workshops like this, uh, which is not the optimum way. You, this is a way to inspire yourself or trainees get inspired. I used to go to workshops in Hong Kong and so on and see how people are doing, get inspired to do the procedures. But one should not see procedures like this and start doing them. This is just a broad uh, map it gives you. The second way is to watch how the procedures are done in our own unit. Who is the best endoscopist in the unit? Keep watching him, see how he's doing. So this is the watch part. And of course, the third part is the doing part. And this is again something that I want to concentrate a little on. Uh, if you actually look at doing endoscopy, traditionally doing endoscopy, uh, for many of us, we have been trained like this, one is to one. So the trainee does the endoscopy, the trainer is standing beside him, directing him 
uh, to go right, left, and so on. This is still the standard method, but there's a problem. The problem is time. You see, now we have so many trainees we have. For example, in our department, we have 15 trainees every year. To do this type of training for every trainee is, now, is not going to be so easy. So over a period of time in future, you'll see that endoscopic training is becoming more structured. And how is this coming about? This is because I think the time has come for us. And this is, again, not only for trainers, but also for tra tra not only for trainees, but also for trainers, that we should start using some of these mechanical simulators, biosimulators. I'll show you some strong data, and I know this is something which is not often discussed in our meetings. So I thought I'll concentrate for another five, 10 minutes on this area. So there are three types of simulators that are available, and what um, we can use first is a mechanical simulator. For example, you have this uh, simulator, which is the ERCP simulator, the Costa Magna simulator, very nice to easy to use, shows you basic cannulation techniques. So if somebody wants to learn ERCP before putting the scope in, I'd advise that he can, this trainer is available freely. You can ask the company representative, they'll come and give you one freely. So you can put this in your department and keep doing it so that the fine technical skills of hand side coordination will come with this. Because this is not right uh, to pass the scope down into the papilla and so on, but at least candidating the papilla gives you a basic skill. Uh, there are other small mechanical uh, simulators available. In fact, you can make one. What I would suggest is, Try and get hold of an old scope in your department that nobody is using, which is not functioning. You can create your own toolboxes like this. Uh, I remember when I was in PGI, we used to do this. We used to actually take the old scopes, usually in the night when nobody is there, then put, um, take bottles and so on and start practicing with side wing scope on this. You can do with upper GI scope, retroflexion, knob control, talk, polypectomy. All this can be, you can create yourself. It's very easy to create these toolboxes. So the first mechanical tools that you can use before you start doing endoscopy is spend a few evenings taking an old endoscopy and doing this. This will give you the hand side coordination required. The next one, of course, is uh, biosimulators. And you can see here quite clearly, this is a biosimulator. And uh, this was actually, you can, uh, who, was, who was long back, we actually got, got him for endoscopic training on biosimulators. He's an expert on this. You can see that, um, we can use a model here, and you can see it's almost realistic that we are doing this, that uh, we can see the uh, papillotomy that's going on. So these biosimulators, okay, there are limitations of these biosimulators, of course, but now we are getting better with them, and this is what we're using now in the department. For example, you can create a new neo papilla, uh, producing neo papilla, so that this can be used for spintotomy and so on. Similarly, now there's several of these biosimulators that are available. Even for endoscopic uh, ultrasound, for example, this is very easy. I think many of the trainees have already started using this. You can actually put a fluid-filled small sac like this in the stomach, create a nice uh, area for endoscopic ultrasound. Anybody can do it in any department uh, where they're getting trained. It's very simple to get these specimens. You can do, train, get trained in endoscopic ultrasound and also drainage of cysts or walled off necrosis uh, with these uh, techniques. Of course, in our department, we created a large training area, realizing the importance, and we realized how thirsty the trainees are. In fact, almost three to 400 have been trained here on this, where we have these uh, areas where you can get uh, trained. And again, I suggest that for all the trainees, insist in your department, create a small corner area where you can have one or two, at least uh, 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 set up, one or two setups there so that you can practice endoscopy. And very easy to get this, uh, Biomodels now. If you actually look at what happens in airline industry, there's no pilot who goes into the uh, training or flies a flight without doing a simulator training. Actually, it's like, for, unfortunately, very, very few of um, endoscopists or even other areas of medicine are actually trained in simulators before they start doing. Now, this is, I think, something again we have to change. In fact, uh, we have worked on this for some time now. and try to use this simulator. These are, these are simulators that are available commercially, but unfortunately extremely costly. With this simulator training, what we find is that you can create a lot of situations, normal anatomy, bleed, uh, abnormal area of papilla, trying to cannulate and so on. And there are studies which have shown that in fact, if you actually do this uh, simulation, you can get trained better, for example, if you have a situation like this, where you can, in fact, uh, um, this is very clearly seen here that you can 
uh, a study which was published from Mayo Clinic where simulated training first resulted in more difficulty in reaching the cecum, whereas compared to people who went directly. So if somebody went through a simulator and then went to the patient, in the first 45 patients, simulator had the advantage. And after 45, 50 patients were done, then both were equal knowledge. In other words, if you want to get good at simulator, you must start training very early on on the simulator. And this is also shown by this study. Again, this is a study which came from UK, which looked at simulator versus direct training. And you can see a structured simulator training, uh, trainings were better. And what is very important is this, that if you actually look at this, in fact, if you look at this, that the first 200 or less procedures, you benefit a lot. But after you've done already 500 procedures, then you don't benefit, which is uh, again, an indication that you must start simulation very early. There are several systematic reviews now which have shown that simulators are good. Uh, so there is a definite argument for using simulators. The reason why this is important is this, that if you are a novice, doing endoscopy complication rates are high, there's lower patient satisfaction and prolongs the procedure. But if you supplement this with uh, simulators, you can see hands-on simulator. Then what happens is that this decreases patient's uh, uh, discomfort and increases your overall performance. And for this reason, now it's advocated that uh, we must use simulators. But there's a problem with simulators. And one of the problem with the simulators is the cost involved. Uh, it's a huge cost that comes with this. And therefore, what we're actually trying to do is develop a simulator is already ready uh, with the Indian Institute of Sciences from Bangalore, which is going to be available uh, from end of this year. This is extremely cheap and probably can be given almost uh, to every college so that they can use this to simulate. So in, in fact, if you, to summarize, if you have to use the simulators, for example, if you have to learn sigmoidoscopy, the mechanical module with computer stimulation is okay. But if you want to learn upper G endoscopy, computer simulators are very good. And then you can go to patients directly. If you want to do colonoscopy, you can do any of these, but computerized and patient is good. But if you want to learn ERCP, for example, computerized simulators are not good. You do mechanical modules and then go directly to the patient. So this is important too, that you can use the simulators in different ways. So when you're doing, it's also important to realize that even technically so-called difficult uh, techniques can be learned easily. For example, if you want to do ERCP, you have to subdivide it into different groups. You have to first know how to pass a side wing scope, intubate the esophagus, how to go from the duodenal papilla into the second part of the duodenum, identify the papilla and scope reduction. So the first part you must spend in this, doing this, the first few cases, 10 cases. And then only you try and go into cannulation so that your trainer, if he's good, he'll tell you how to do this. First do this, then go into actual cannulation, where they use the papillotome or wire guided and so on. And then start interpreting images. Again, if you want to learn ERCP, unless you're good at interpreting images, it's not a good thing to be half technically good, but not good in cognitive sense. And of course, finally, after say two or three months, once you've mastered this technique, then you can go into spintrotomy, stone extraction, and so on. In fact, the most difficult part of ERCP is native pap papilla cannulation. And once you can achieve this consistently, you are well trained. In this. Similarly for US, you should know how to use a side wing endoscope, the principles of ultrasound, US anatomy, staging system, image acquisition, and of course, fine needle aspiration. So this is the pathway for you how to go in US. You should not take an US scope and say, suddenly I want to learn how to do a wand drainage. Uh, so that type of thing. I think this is very important to go through all this. Now, this is something I don't strongly believe in, but all societies have guidelines saying, when do you become competent in endoscopy? The competency is based, unfortunately, it's very difficult to see competency very objectively. So they give numbers. If you can do 200 ERCPs, or if you get an 80% cannulation rate, or if you do 150 US, and staging accuracy is similar to the instructor, then you're competent. Uh, there are again some guidelines for EMR, ESD, POEMs, and so on. But unfortunately, these are guidelines which are individual societies have different guidelines. We have some also, but I think we have to work on this because I think the best way to actually assess these uh, candidates are so called DOPS technique. DOPS is direct observation of procedure skill. 
and it's done by a committee which is the joint advisory group uh, from UK, which probably the best training uh, centers. They have the JAG, which oversees training of colonoscopy in all the UK residents, and they do it very well. They, for example, they want to see how uh, you know the technical aspects, you know how to do it, you have to show them how to do it, and finally you do it in a structured fashion. Again, we don't have exit exams and endoscopy for trainees. They just have to have proficiency based upon what the internal is thinking. But some way in future, probably, hopefully, we'll get this. Uh, so because it's important to assess uh, how this is done. Now, I come to the last part of this area. This is how should a trainee approach a trainer? How should you select your trainer? That's very important. This is, I think, something that a trainee should not go to anybody who's doing endoscopy thinking he's a trainer and get trained. You have to select a trainee. And let me show you a mantra in this. Uh, if you actually look, look at all your trainers, they fall into four categories. The first category are those who are unconsciously incompetent. And this is, unfortunately, the dangerous group of trainers. They're incompetent. They don't know they're incompetent. So they do all sorts of, for example, they're trying to do a needle knife without doing it properly, and they're incompetent. The second group of trainers are those who are consciously incompetent. They know they can't do the procedure. And many times you can see this when you're with your senior professor trying to do an ERCP, he'll say, in between, kuch kaam hai mera jana, and gives it to the junior who's more competent. At least he's conscious that he's incompetent. Again, he's not the right person. The third uh, group of the people are the ones you see most frequently. And these are unconscious competence. This is now, to understand this term, it means this chap is very good in the procedure. He can do the procedure very well, but he can't explain it to you. So he's got unconscious competence. Although this is the largest group of people, I know many, many senior gastroenterologists who are extremely good at procedures, but they can't explain it to you. They come at this unconscious competence. The person you require to train are the conscious competence people. This is the effective training. He knows how to do it. He is conscious, he's competent, but, and also he's effective trainer. So this is the group. Now, this is not an easy group to find, but you can make out in each department, there'll be one or two people who are like this, who are consciously competent. And they know how to deconstruct a procedure and show you. They know how to explain it very clearly. And this is the group you should know. Because as has been told very often, those who know do, those that understand teach. And this is the best trainer. Now, let me show you a few examples. Uh, this is taken from our uh, workshop, uh, some of this, uh, just to illustrate. You see, this is Guido Costa Magna trying to do, put in a third or fourth stent in a patient who already had multiple stents in his picture. And look at his uh, technique. He's, of course, technique you watch, but also look at the patients. He went on and on and doing this procedure for a long time. He's conscious, he's competent, he's patient, and he's explaining this continuously to his uh, uh, colleagues around him. Similarly, this is another example. I think you can see Parir Rai also in our last workshop here, along with Horst Nihat. Look at Horst, fantastic, one of the best endoscopists in the world. And look at his eyes, how he's concentrating. Terrific amount of, he's not even blinking his eyes, he's just concentrating. And this is what a good endoscopist requires. Cut out the rest of the world uh, from, uh, from everything else and just concentrate, like Arjun said when you're shooting the arrow that you're seeing only the eye there. So this is what you must concentrate, concentrate as an endoscopist, take out the side. But it's also important to communicate with others around you. And this is, an, again, part of an endoscopy workshop. You can see Sandeep Matthew Phillips with Greg Hurst and Dong Wen Sio. They are very easy. They are not taking it uh, very tense. They are, because this is a procedure that you don't require to consider too much. You have to have ability, the trainer, ability to communicate with others around him, to communicate with the assistant. And as a trainee, you should learn these skills. Be relaxed. Communicate with your uh, assistant so that you can tell him what to do and don't start throwing instruments and throwing and so on. This is not the right thing. And finally, look at, again, uh, Guido Costa Magna. He's showing a technique and when he's showing a technique as the person who's explaining it, he spends time in different aspects. Look at him showing his hands. So a trainer, you should watch what he's doing, how he's moving, he's moving the shaft to get right orientation of the papilla. And he's cutting in small bits, not, not long cuts as he's doing it. And he's explaining this to the trainees around him. So this is the right trainer you must select. A trainer who has this ability not only to be competent, but consciously competent to explain to you how we can do these procedures. And this is very important. So 
we come to these aspects and uh, we have maybe we should give a short break here because we already passed 20 minutes now take some questions and then come back to three very important areas how to deal with complications one of the important things as endoscopists is we are physicians who forget that we should think like surgeons when you get a complication we have to deal with ourselves sometimes we require a surgical friend cell but we have to deal with it we have then we'll go on to what are the risks of being endoscoping and a few personal observations of mine i have which i thought i should uh, let you know so i think uh, going should we take up the questions uh, nagi ajay here ajay yeah yes uh, see uh, can we remove the slide on the display uh, yeah we are removing the slide okay we have uh, some questions from the audience before i go on to that i will uh, first of all thanks a lot for a uh, doing a basic uh, orientation towards the whole uh, subject at least that's what we expect from you my question is that um, the what do you think in the first 6 months you said that a resident should go for a upper gi training after 6 months yes do you think the ideal time to teach them about the disinfection of the endoscopes and the pre and post procedure management should be in the first 6 months or we combine that I'm yeah just there i think ajay you're absolutely right that's why i said the first 6 months uh, we should uh, there's a itch for training to come and take the scope and want to do it mm-hmm. but i think we should not allow that we should uh, like i showed you the full training component the pre procedure indications how sc- um, how scopes are disinfected and uh, those things should be taught in fact uh, i remember as in tj i'm sure uh, it's similar to vivek and going also how we used to clean the scope so first 6 months we were actually just cleaning mechanical we didn't have scope cleaners and so on we were just cleaning the scopes uh, so i think the first 6 months should be a thought not the technical aspects but more of these pre procedure aspects including disinfection and uh, then of course before he actually touches a single scope uh, nagi the number of uh, questions on one uh, uh two things i i put it bhavesh but from bhavnagar has basically suggested in a good uh, question i will feel that should we include the basic ercp and a diagnostic us in the basic gi fellowship rather than in the advanced endoscopic training <laughs> so this is again i sort of debated in my talk this is a lot of controversy in this area uh, there are most if you actually we had a poll in one of the gi meetings among uh, fellows and wanted to know how many wanted to have basic ercp us incorporated in the training fellowship 90% of them wanted 90% of them wanted i had a little contrary opinion not that uh, i want to discourage this but i think a basic uh, gastroenterologist should learn how to do upper gi colon few basic procedures very simple bleeding polypectomies foreign border removal and so on and should know how to pass a side wing to the papilla now to learn detailed ercp skills is not enough time in a third year one and not necessary similarly to know detailed us skills is not enough time if you decide for example that you want to have a career more in endoscopy then you go into detail, you go into an advanced fellowship program and learn all these things i know the fellows won't agree with me i am little unpopular because i'm saying this they say that you did everything now you don't want others to but if you actually look at it there is a different skill level from different people there are some people who are very good hands eye coordination they want to go into endoscopy the trainer can encourage them to go for advanced fellowship and do this otherwise if you start training everybody in all advanced endoscopy procedures ultimately there are many who would land up in hepatology or clinical pancreatology or research for them it's waste not only a waste they don't have the aptitude so i think uh, as fellowship directors we should be very clear on what we should and i think even isg should do this also make clear cut uh, platform that these are going to be taught they may be exceptional cases there may be somebody whose hands eye coordination is so good or is going he, he tells the department look i'm going to go to my district nothing is there can i spend extra three okay you do your fellowship and spend extra three months in acquiring the skills so i think that should be the right policy uh, nagi there is a uh, two issues i mean uh, i think the number of questions to inquire i don't think we can handle it here that is what are the centers for advanced endoscopic training after the uh, yeah. dnb training my uh, 
I like to submit here from my side that uh, uh, DNB is the National Board of Examinations is seriously thinking of introducing an advanced endoscopic fellowship course. And uh, if that matures, that will, I think, become official. But uh, if you want to answer this question, you can answer. Otherwise, you can. So, no, I think what we'll do is some of these questions, I can actually see on the screen huge number of questions. Some of these questions we should actually send by mailers. For example, yeah. we can, we can, this I think ISG also can come in, go in the way where we can give all the training centers that are showing, having advanced training, provided we take permissions from them that they can do. Uh, Nagi, I have a question. You talked about cognitive skills and the tra technical training. Do you think cognitive skills can be trained? I mean, or, or can be, uh, 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 can, can a person be trained in the cognitive skills or do they come with it? Can no. they come with it? Actually, cognitive skills have two components. One of them is very easy, like the indications, preparations, and so on. But the second component is more difficult, even the, then more difficult than the technical part. And that is image interpretation and uh, wisdom of interpretation. These two things you get only working in a good unit, which is doing this constantly. For example, now with image, image uh, enhanced endoscopy, narrowband imaging, you should have the capability of seeing what is early malignancy, what is inflammation, and so on. These skills take time. The training is going on in all the institutions in our country. The fellows are getting better. But I think these are the skills that will take time, and but can be taught and should be taught. Nagi and Vivek here. Uh, what do you think in this context? How about what is it you see as the future of artificial intelligence in this pattern recognition software that have come in, in radiology and histopathology? Do you see them coming into GI endoscopy also? Yeah, I think Vivek, that's a, that's a good question. I think it is going to come. We are already having now, in fact, uh, the last three, four months, we have uh, GI papers, a lot of papers on artificial intelligence. And there's been a whole submit of artificial intelligence in GI endoscopy. I think it's a question of time uh, where this would come in and where then the fellows will be taught of how to use artificial intelligence in interpreting these images. Because then interpretation will become easier once you have algorithms. But I think maybe it'll take at least three, four years. For the immediate fellows, this may not be so much of it. I think that we will otherwise run short of time. So what yeah. we do is there are a number of questions which you can answer on email. Yeah, I, I think, think we can proceed with the second part of your talk. Yeah. Right. So my second part of the talk is based upon the fact that uh, as endoscopists, of course, we're now finished how a trainee should get trained and learn and so on. But uh, what is important is not only just doing procedures, but how to deal with the uh, complications first. So can I have the slide on? Then we'll so how to deal with complications is important because as interventional endoscopy we are, or even diagnostic endoscopy, we are bound to produce complications. Uh, endoscopy is an invasive and potentially hazardous uh, technique. So, uh, we saw earlier, as soon as you produce a complication, we used to shy away, send it off to our uh, um, surgical yeah. colleagues and so on. This is no longer happening. Over 95% of endoscopic complications can now be managed endoscopically and I think all trainees should be trained how to do it. If you produce a bleed, how to stop the bleed. If you produce a perforation, we now have many, many types of clips. Uh, so first learn that. You can do it on animal model. Again, instead of trying to do advanced endoscopy, just simple thing. When you have a perforation, how to apply clips, starting from the, from the lateral part, getting centrally, or how to use OVESCO clips and so on. These are simple things that can be learned and should be a part of the training curriculum. Because what happens is, if you produce an endoscopic complication and you cannot treat it, in fact, this was a cartoon, but actually happened long back in my career. I was called by one senior gastroenterologist who put in a colonoscope, it became a knot in the rectum, he couldn't get it out. Now, that was a very embarrassing situation because you can't send the patient to surgeon. This fortunately, after deep sedation, we could denot it. So I think you have to know how to tackle the situations. Because the other important thing to remember, this is very, very important, is for the fellows, no procedure is make or break. You may not be able to do a good polypectomy in that particular patient, or you may not be able to do an adequate spintrotomy. But for the patient, if you do a wrong procedure, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, break, a breaking event for the patient. This is important to remember. So that's why I think your skill should be very gradually learned. Sometimes don't push. If you're not sure, if you have a large polyp, you're not very sure. You, can, you independently can do it. Call a trainer so that he can be there with you under supervision it can be done. Because this is very important because 
uh, you require certain skills when dealing with this uh, complication. And I'll show you one very interesting video here. This is the video of London World Congress where Michael Burke from Hyderabad was doing this, doing an ampelectomy in the patient. Now, when he's doing this ampelectomy, you can see that as soon as they did the ampelectomy, there's a massive bleed. So this is, and see this two vessels there broke. But look at Michael Burke's face. He's actually not perturbed. You have seen this earlier, so naturally, of course, he's not. He's now discussing what to do next. He's telling the assistant, "Get ready for these instruments," and he's already getting ready with that. So he knows that the lower part of the bleed he can't clip because the pancreatic duct is there. So he's taking a, a smaller. Uh, so he's. You can see that he has taken a heater probe there, and the upper part he knows that he can burn. So he's taking a coagulation probe there and uh, coagulating, and then stop the bleed. So he knows that. First of all, he's prepared for this. He's got both the clips and the co-op grasper with which to treat this. He knows which part to treat which. But most important than all this, we can learn all this theoretically. Look at his uh, face. You know, he's absolutely not perturbed, and this is very important. When we're doing a procedure and a complication occurs, we can actually distinguish between a good endoscopist and a bad endoscopist by just looking at his face. On the screen, of course, it becomes more obvious. Uh, you have to be extremely calm. If you, you are in trouble, just stop, take a deep breath, count up to 10, and then start doing the procedure. If you, at this point of time, of course, if you are in a department, large department, you can get help from somebody to come and do the rest of the procedure for you. But it's very important to have a surgical mentality. An endoscopist, at least at this point of time, should have a surgical mentality to tackle this. Otherwise, these complications, you produce a complication, you go and talk to relatives, you'll have problems because they know obviously from your face what has happened. So this is uh, very important. The second important thing as a trainee, you should also learn is the art of breaking the news of a complication. And unless you're calm, you have to. So this is a very troublesome thing, especially in a country, you have a mob of people there, you can't go and tell them, I'm sorry, I perforated or something. So there's a way of doing it. Again, there's not enough time for me to develop this uh, topic maybe some other time in future there's a way of doing how you can explain this very nicely to the attendant without adding the facts and getting out of it but one of the things that we started doing a lot now is based upon this Atul Gawande's book this was actually made for surgeons but we start using it in endoscopy also a checklist manifesto all fellows should read this book how to avoid complications and uh, we now have a checklist manifesto we have a checklist nurse now in our unit who checks all the cases so before you get a case, for example, if you have a poem, you know what are the things that have to be checked, whether you have carbon dioxide flowing, not oxygen. If you have an ERCP, you have to know whether rectal endomedicine is given. This checklist are very important for the trainee to know. All procedures should have a checklist. And initially in your training period, you should be the checklist nurse so that you get used to this. And after you get trained, of course, you can employ other people. Uh, because unfortunately, um, like in every sphere of medicine, you can't be perfect without practice. And practice, that is a training for endoscopy, can create problems. So your practice has to be done in a very graded, in a, in a good manner. Otherwise, you can uh, develop problems. Uh, as a part of training, one of the important things that's often neglected is this. And this is post-procedure. Communication of finding to the patient, management plan, pathology follow-up complications. I'd advise all trainees, don't think of endoscopic training or learning as just putting in scopes, technically doing things. This is part of your training. How to communicate the findings to the patient, what is the further management plan, following up with pathology, and looking after complications. The complication may not be immediate. A post-ERCP pancreatitis can come after 12 hours, or a delayed perforation can come after 24 hours. So you have to be prepared of uh, dealing with this. And, uh, Finally, I come to another area, which I know is uh, not very popular, but I want to tell all the youngsters here, trainees, that when they're going into, if you're going into a full-time endoscopist role, what are the risks? There's some risks also, and one of the risks is, is radiation. I want you all to be aware of this risk because radiation damage can be quite uh, uh, serious. For example, the damage radiation depends upon the time you spend in the procedure. If you're not very good, you start doing all sorts of uh, it takes a long time. The distance you have from the machine and shielding, adequate shielding is important. This is because one of my colleagues, young colleague actually died of leukemia 
and there was a direct relationship to radiation. So I think there's some relationship and you have to be careful about that. Second is musculoskeletal injuries. And if you're doing a lot of things and not doing it properly, you can develop musculoskeletal injury. This is actually a hands of a very famous New York endoscopist. I can't name him, but he was kind enough to give his uh, picture here. You can see what happened. He's got interphalangeal, metacarpophalangeal joints are all completely uh, destroyed because of constantly doing endoscopy. And in this initial phase, the endoscopic knobs were not very good, not easy to use, and thousands and thousands of endoscopy later. So you can develop things like this, but can sometimes be very, very subtle. And this is actually a cervix, uh, X-ray of one of our unit endoscopies to develop severe sudden cervical spondylosis. It's a very common injury. And I like to warn all the trainees to be aware of this. Uh, and why this has occurred? Because earlier on, this is how, again, I, I think uh, both Vivek Govind and Ajay will remember these type of uh, monitors we used to have in the endoscopy rooms. High up, everybody thought this was the right way. You look up on the top and these are three examples of endoscopy monitors and many of us in the older age group actually tended to develop this very early. And this is very clear here if you can see that if cervical spine angle determines whether you have how you oh, can develop abnormal angle and this can give rise to a problem. So it's very important that you have your endoscopy monitor exactly. The, you can see the monitor in our unit. This is what is recommended and this is how it should be. The monitor height, uh, how it should be adjusted, viewing distance and all are very important, which are not, again, emphasized in literature, not emphasized to uh, the trainees. Again, how you keep your endoscope is very important because if you put your endoscope, start learning wrong technique, then you can start having problems. For example, if you're doing a, a colonoscopy, the endoscopy position is ideally this way, very relaxed. See how the scope is held. Look at the fingers where they should be. Learn the correct technique of scope. Holding the scope is very important. And these are two, again, for example, for colonoscopy, you're holding the scope down like this. For endoscopy, you're holding it up. The scope should be at the chest position. I've seen many times trainees coming and holding the scope high up like that, which is wrong. It should be in the position of the chest. And similarly for colonoscopy, it should be transverse. And that's then you get the maximum benefit without mechanical damage. It's also important that in all endoscopy rooms ask for this. There's a mat, because we also ask our endoscopy with very specialized slippers, but there's mats which are anti-static, which help to decrease your mechanical injuries. Uh, so, Optical ergonomic room design is important. Height of the monitor, adjustable beds. It's again very important that the height of the bed, nobody cares about it. You're bending down and doing endoscopy and getting to problem, then you get this. Uh, infection risks are becoming increasingly important and you can see that we are now starting to base this visors. Earlier we're not doing it. I know there are a lot of questions on Corona, which is not part of this talk, but I think increasingly we're starting to use it. These are now cheap, easily available. Maybe in, in training itself, we should be getting used to how these are going to be used because they become part of it. And finally, burnout syndrome. Uh, those who are going to endoscopy should realize that endoscopy is a stressful job. I don't want to go into the details of the study, but a very interesting study showed that people are doing endoscopy, especially the junior consultants who are doing endoscopy. Can, if the screen can fully can see better, if, if junior consultants have more stresses and uh, they have an earlier burnout compared to senior MDs. So if you're starting to do interventional endoscopy and if you're not enjoying it, if it's too much stressful to a trainee, I would suggest that you stop doing it and go to other procedures. This is very important to decide. And finally, I'll end by a few personal observations and these are purely personal because of uh, my being in this area for many, many years, I thought I should convey this. First important thing is in something that I found in some of our trainees, they become skilled uh, a young trainee becomes very skilled in, say, ERCP or EUS or third space endoscopy. Immediately, a certain amount of arrogance that comes in. Uh, this is not only good for him, but also not good for the patient because he's going to overextend his indications, produce a lot of damage because he thinks he can do everything. Uh, this is a sculpture that I found in uh, many, many years back in uh, Italy. And you can see this is Michelangelo, who was 88 years, doing his last sculpture, unfinished. He says, I'm still learning. I think as endoscopists, we are still learning. At, at any point of age, we are still learning. Over a year, over a year, especially it's found that 67 is the cutoff point. After 67, your technical skills come down, but your cognitive skills keep increasing. 
you become better at image interpretation, you have wisdom of knowing when to go in and draw, so on. So this is very important. That's the reason why I suggest to all our younger trainees to have some humility and learn from your seniors in your each unit. Most of the time I learned a lot from these pioneers in 1970s. By the time they're already very senior, they're the ones who actually were responsible for ERCP, EUS and so on. But all of them had one major important quality, humility. In spite of the fact that they became top of the field, they continue to be this. And I think this is extremely important for the trainees that whatever level you may, you may have very good skills, you may be extremely good, but continue to learn. And the other important thing that I like to tell trainees is that you can do many things. You can, uh, if you're good at ERCP, get in passive wire all the time. But what is can is not equivalent to should. You can do something, but it should not be. If you, for example, have an in strong indication, it should be done. If you have a dilated bile duct, but no stones, you should not just cut the papilla just because it's dilated, in suspecting that it may might be. So I think it's very important that can is not equivalent to should. And the other important thing I learned is this is Michel Kramer. Michel Kramer was one of the pioneers in endoscopy. And when he died, he had, I had access to some of his uh, uh, old charts. And you can see that in the first nine endoscopies, ERCPC failed, he passed in 10. He also had one patient die due to a complication because of uh, Dizepam given at that time. But in spite of that, he persisted. Two important lessons. Persistence is very important. You should do your procedure slowly, never be in a hurry. Learn it slowly because the patient is important. And of course, honesty, at least to yourself. If you're going to do repeatedly 20, 30 side wing scopes, you're not able to come to the papilla, something wrong. You must change your technique, change your trainer, or you should contemplate and see whether your hand-eye skills is not enough for this and whether you should do something else. So I think this is very important. This type of honesty is very important. And other important thing is to be friend with your surgeon. If you want to develop a career in therapeutic endoscopy, you should have a friendly surgeon with you. And of course, we had Dr. G. V. Rao with us for many, many years. The reason is then you're more confident. If you have a complication, you know 95% of the time you can solve the complication yourself. But in the 5% of the time, it may be a life and death situation for your uh, patient. So that kindly, whenever you're going into a career of therapeutic endoscopy, get a good friendly surgeon with you to be with you. And finally, this is something I learned many, many years back. This was uh, a... This was actually an ascariasis trying to cannulate the papilla. And you can see what it's doing. It doesn't suddenly go into the ampulla. It goes in very slowly, it palpates, and then gently gets. Because the cannulation rate of ascariasis for the bile duct is 100%. Because if it goes into the pancreatic duct, it dies. Unfortunately for us, endoscopy, this is not true. Complicated. If you go into the pancreatic duct repeatedly, the patient has pancreatitis and dies not happening. But for the for the ascaris is the reverse. And that's the reason why it's so careful. It actually goes around, palpates the papilla, and then gently goes into the thing. So this is a very, very important lesson that I learned very on that you have to be very gentle at therapeutic endoscopy. And only when you're very careful that you can actually uh, do benefit to the patient. And also I come to another point. This is regarding publications. Unfortunately, uh, we are so busy with therapeutic endoscopy in our country, training and so on. Trainees not, tend not to go into this. But there's a difference between endoscopy and general gastroenterology. In endoscopy, what is happening, what comes in endoscopy, GI endoscopy and so on, is very quickly translated into uh, practice. So you have to follow it very carefully. And second, I think we start thinking of publication. Even publishing, for example, our own society, Society of GI Endoscopy, has a journal of digestive endoscopy. You can start publishing in that. Start with that, and then you can go up. This is very, very important. At least two or three publications in endoscopy before you finish your fellowship program gives an indication that you have an incl inclination towards doing advanced fellowship program. I think this is something that uh, is because. And then finally, I'd like to emphasize this, that training for GI endoscopy is training in gastroenterology. We are not training technicians. It's very important that all of you fellows are not technicians. You are gastroenterologists. You have to be trained as somebody who's treating the patient as a whole, as a gastrointestinal endoscopist and not technician. And this is again forgotten. We should uh, come back to this. Trainees should realize this, that this is part of it. That's the reason why in the question hour I emphasize that we should learn basics first, gastroenterology first, and then when you are very confident, go into advanced training. And finally, 
again coming back to this mantra unfortunately i can't give you a single mantra but i can give you this mantra of malcolm gladwell when he wrote this book on outliers he said that this is shown in every industry any part that if you have to become very good in a particular procedure you should go on repeatedly doing it researcher researchers uh, given uh, abstract number 10000 hours it need not be 10000 hours but if you want to get good in any procedure you must do it repeatedly patience is required patience is good not only for us but for the patient because ultimately he is at the end of the stick so finally i'd like to end by again thanking the isg um, vivek govin and ajay for this uh, giving me this opportunity and i think endoscopy like everything else is team work uh, endoscopy is now getting sub specialized so what i would suggest to the youngsters is that if you are interested in a good endoscopy career in future go into this get trained in a proper place but sub specialize into one area you may be a good third space endoscopist good pancreatic ureter endoscopist or a good colonoscopy or a small bowel endoscopy sub specialize and then be a part of a large team and that's when you'll enjoy doing endoscopy and also your contribution will increase also thank you very much for your time thank you very much dr reddy it's been absolutely outstanding as we always come to have almost come to expect from you unfortunately this forum does not allow for applause and standing ovations otherwise i'm very sure that every one of your viewers would have been standing and applauding a masterly presentation we have been really um uh, fascinating insights uh, using an ascaris to teach papillary cannulation i think is a brilliant uh, thinking uh, I, i think um, we have had about uh, over 100 questions and many of them are repetitive some that dr ajay has already gone over i'll try to pick some which i think are really uh, important issues dr amol bapie from pune has this question that do you think there should be an entrance level assessment for accepting a trainee into advanced gi endoscopy fellowships many people qualify dm dnb and then apply and they are grossly deficient in their basic endoscopic skills but since they finished dm they apply for advanced gi fellowships what are your thoughts on that sir yeah so i think i absolutely agree with amol that there should be some sort of an exit exam where uh, first of all gi fellows are taught about uh, the fellowship i mean basic endoscopy the like what the jag has done now jag has put a dops that is direct observation procedure skill and then for a person is passed out or you can do it on simulators because simulators now are very accurate you can quantify exact training or skill of the person with the simulator the only problem with this although this is ideal is this one is of course it takes a long time to adapt and all the training centers we have about say 250 trainees from dm or dnb coming out of a country all these centers don't have the i think the facilities for doing this and that's what makes it diff- difficult but again if somebody wants to come into a program say two years of doing advanced therapeutic endoscopy i strongly suggest that whoever wants to do this should be first evaluated by the trainer to see if he has the the not only the skills but the aptitude to go on doing this otherwise it'd be waste of training somebody in all this and then again gets into general practice you're wasting the time of the trainer right um, the in continuation with this the questions were that should there be or should it be mandated that there should be a standard basic uh, pattern of teaching gi endoscopy in the for the beginner as well as should we now move on to some standard certification programs for advanced gi endoscopy uh, in our country yeah i think it's very this is very important i think isg should also play a role in this we should uh, like what the asg does the esg does we should have a standardized formal structured training program which all centers which are training gi fellows in basic endoscopy should follow and like a tick off you know that you are done this procedures this is the thing and all the log books are supposed to be maintained very often is just a very arbitrary but i think if you have a structured program of how they go through this training this will be extremely useful and i think as indian society gastroenterology body this may be a good thing for us to think of in fact i think there are many suggestions from many people about how, how uh, suggestions of how isg can play a role so i think those are questions that probably we will best answer uh, through the mail once they come to you and to other isg people the other question that i had was from dr pial nag a radiologist who says that he is very impressed with the talk and what are your views on a radiologist learning endoscopic ultrasound similarly there is a question from a surgeon dr vijay from baroda 
that he's finished his MS training and uh, what do you think of when should a surgeon get into third space endoscopic procedures? What should be the procedure for that? What do you think, sir? Yeah. So two questions, both from friends I know. PR is uh, right. The interventional uh, radiologists are now so busy with so many things. I don't think they now would want to go into endoscopic ultrasound. In the beginning when endoscopic ultrasound came, especially in UK, there were some radiologists doing endoscopic ultrasound. In our own unit, we started endoscopic ultrasound with that ultrasonologist was very good who started doing it. But over a period of time, it was realized that endoscopic ultrasound has now shifted from being a purely diagnostic to purely therapeutic procedure. There's very little diagnostic uh, US. It's becoming more and more therapeutic US. And therefore, I think uh, a gastroenterologist uh, who trained in this or a GS surgeon would be more appropriate. Uh, and as I said, interventional radiologists now have their own uh, area when they're becoming more and more busy. Regarding what Vijay asked, uh, or what Vijay says, uh, regarding when you should go into third space endoscopy. I think third space endoscopy, in fact, uh, actually is less difficult than ERCP or US. It's more easier to do. The only thing is there's fear among physicians that uh, you're going to third space, bleeding, and so on. But surgeons take it up much more faster. So third space endoscopy can be part of what I firmly believe is that once you finish your fellowship program, either... Uh, gastro or gastro surgery, then you're, you're keen to become an advanced endoscopist. In this two years endoscopy program, you should have everything. You should have uh, pancreatic blade endoscopy, third space endoscopy, US and so on. And then as you get more and more interested, you can sub-specialize in it. For example, we have in our unit two or three people doing only third space predominantly because as you increase experience, you get better. So I think it's a, the aptitude is very important for third space endoscopy. You must have a little surgical mind to get into it. Uh, there is a question. Uh, yes, uh, there is a uh, issue was one, uh, training about the where you talked about uh, all the things. One is how to write the report that should also be stressed yeah. in the training part, which is very important. Yeah. The very interesting uh, suggestion by uh, I'm not sure who did that. Should the endoscopist have a rotation in surgical discipline to learn? How to break the news, uh, bad news. Yeah, yeah so this is uh, again another good question, but because it was for the trainees, I didn't go into too, too much of these complexities. But I think uh, it will be useful if the GI physicians can actually rotate for a few, say, one month or so on in the surgical department to see what's happening. The problem, of course, is the turf war that occurs usually in many institutions between surgeons and physicians, whether they would really allow this. In our department, it's our policy because we have been working very closely. Our, our uh, trainees would go to surgical department and the surgical trainees come to our department. And in fact, uh, the surgical people also do some endoscopy. So it's a combined uh, thing. But I think uh, it's basically the local politics. Ideally, it would be good if at least one or two months are spent to know some surgical principles because endoscopy is becoming more and more surgical. Uh, Dr. Reddy, this one of the important uh... Uh, issue is uh, identification of lesions, and and uh, which is uh, really important in early part of uh, their training, because what happens as the, you uh, keep going and you don't know how, what how to describe a lesion, and lesion identification on uh, the normal endoscopy is one of the very very important aspect uh, uh, we believe, and and that's where we don't uh, in most training center uh, there's not much emphasis on training them the basic uh, lesion identification. And, and from there, uh, that's a, one of the most basic things we must learn uh, during the early part of uh, the training. Yes, so I agree, Goin. I think uh, this is very important to start very early on in the fellowship programs. And luckily, we have three-year fellowship. Initially, it used to be two-year, three-year now. So you have enough time to develop all this. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Reddy, there was this question from uh, pediatricians. Uh, advanced GI endoscopy among pediatric patients, uh, who should be doing it, uh, depending on this, should it have to be a pediatric gastroenterologist or an adult gastroenterologist with the skills should be doing it? Uh, the other is, uh, what are the avenues for endo and advanced endoscopy training from, for a pediat those with a pediatric gastroenterology background? Uh, unfortunately, the pediatric endoscopy is a neglected subject, not only in our country, all over the world. There are no specialized pediatric endoscopy training centers anywhere in the world. There are some places where a uh, lot of pediatric patients are referred, so they become much more 
good in it. But I think basically you don't need to be a pediatrician to do pediatric uh, uh, interventional endoscopy. A good endoscopist can tackle pediatrics. Of course, uh, when children are less than two years, they require specialized instrumentation in form of uh, the type of scope you have, axillaries you have, and so on. But in general, above four years, children above four years, adult uh, endoscopists can tackle this very easily. You don't require to have special skills. If a pediatrician is specifically interested in doing, uh, uh, say, for example, enhancing his career in pediatric endoscopy, this is very good, but we find very few of these. If they're there, I think they can. And even in our country, maybe there should be areas where we can have specialized centers which are doing more pediatric and training pediatric endoscopy. Unfortunately, it doesn't go. Well, at a Lucknow SGPGI, we have both yeah. a pediatric DM gastroenterology department and a DM gastro and DM pediatric gastro. Yes. Sir. And while they are doing their own basic training and include yes. US for pediatric ERCP, for example, they come to the adult unit and I'm doing all the pediatric ERCPs yeah. and pediatric trainees come and observe till the basic level. But the question of advanced training still remains. Yeah, I agree. I think Vivek, that is the only center now in the country. It is very ideal for pediatric uh, gastro training, but I think uh, it's difficult to duplicate this in, around the country. Uh, there, I think there have been a lot of meetings regarding COVID-19, the pandemic, and how to do endoscopy during COVID, yeah. but still I think the audience uh, have uh, full of questions. So one said was, what precautions to take during this period for an upper GI endoscopy? And the second the trainee's question was, how will this affect uh, uh, training of uh, during uh, because of the epidemic? And finally, Will there be any changes in our practice of GI endoscopy that we learn from the COVID that should carry on post COVID? Yeah, so I, again, I didn't want to touch on this because we're having too many of these seminars, but just briefly, uh, the, the, I think the hygiene standards are same. There's no difference between COVID and non COVID. The scope disinfection is similar, there's no change. The only problem is when you get in patients to do endoscopy, uh, the Society of GI Endoscopy has now put in guidelines available in the Journal of uh, GI Endoscopy of India. You can look into that. But when the patients come in, we divide them into low risk, intermediate, high risk, based on three categories. If the patient has fever or symptoms of COVID, uh, contact with any COVID patients or a history of any travel. So if they come into, they have these three things, the high risk, they would come. And these patients, now we don't directly do endoscopy unless it's a dire emergency. They are quickly screened and fortunately for us, we are starting to get the spot test now. We are, will advocate in future that a spot test is done and those who are positive, unless it is a cholangitis or a GI bleed, we don't do endoscopy till it's at least off. Those who are intermediate risk, say one of this is their travel or contact, but no actual symptoms. In these people, we do with all the precautions. You can see the visor and all we showed you that we are wearing with double gloves and, uh, and a gown which cannot be getting wet. The, of course, for those who are not having a, in the low risk group, there is some fear now that because of high asymptomatic carriers, they can transmit. So what we have done is we of course don't have to follow all the precautions like high risk, but I think at least make it mandatory now that everybody wears a mask in endoscopy. And this has been shown that you don't have to have an N95 mask. Recently, Alexander Repici has shown that even if you have a standard surgical mask, it's good enough to protect you. Standard mask, for some who want a visor, they can wear a visor. But for the patients, we use a special mouth gag which covers with a mask so that when they actually cough or sneeze, nothing comes on to us. So basic precautions for low risk group, a little higher precautions for intermediate. High risk group, I think we have to now start thinking of doing spot tests to see whether they're positive or not before we take them even for emergency. Uh, there is a Dr. Anand from Chennai has wanted to know whether what are the thoughts about a standard consent protocol for all procedures. This as I think Ajay mentioned about standard endoscopy reporting. I mean, medical legal issues mandate that uh, there should be a standard minimum protocol and how, what uh, is it available? Are you doing it? Uh, maybe some thoughts from you. Sir. Yeah. So I think this is again part of our training and uh, the trainee, I think should be trained in this. This is again something neglected and Ajay had mentioned this earlier. Is neglected because endoscopy means pushing the scope, seeing the lesions and so on. Uh, taking a consent and a standard consent form, how it should be explained is important. Uh, actually, in fact, if you look at legality, uh, it's it said that the person who's doing endoscopy should himself personally explain to the patient and take the person patient consent in the local language after explaining adequately. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen. We don't have so much time, all of us, to do this. But a trainee actually should be 
doing this first so that you get used to how this can be taken, how this can be explained. Explaining the procedure and explaining the post procedure are the most important aspect of training, I think, and that training should be uh, evolving. In fact, if I can add here, uh, the, the, during the uh, uh, meeting in uh, Kerala, ISGCon 2018, uh, we had a meeting with the uh, experts making constant form for endoscopy. So we still have to work on that. And then we can have a defined endoscopy, uh, a, a constant form for endoscopy, upper GI, colonoscopy, and ERCP in a standard format. And that we can put on our website where everybody can download and use that. Uh, I can ask one other question, which is one of the uh, resident asked, uh, that what should be height of a uh, ERCP table? Height of the ERCP table. Yeah. Yes. So height, height of the ERCP table, we, I, again, I showed you the ergonomics that have been published very well, should be de based upon the person. Of course, shorter people have a different height and longer. General principle is the ERCP table should come up to your uh, elbow. When you rest your elbow, I, maybe I can come back into this uh, full screen. So a height of the ERCP table should come up to your elbow here. And so depending upon uh, what your height is, uh, fortunately, now most of the ERCP tables are adjustable. You can go up and down. But if it is too low, less than 10 centimeters than this, then you tend to get go down. If it's too high, above this 6 centimeters, then there is a problem. So there's a, there's a range. But general principle is you should be just below your elbow. That for colonoscopy also same? For colonoscopy? Yeah, for, for, for endoscopy, similar. For, but for colonoscopy, it should be about 6 uh, centimeters below because then it's much easier for colonoscopy. It's very high in both. Again, uh, I've given two references in my talk. Both these references are there, which gives you exact measurements of the table uh, based upon two important studies. That have happened. So if you say that we can stop here or take some more questions. That's and awesome. For me, it's okay, but I don't know whether we're 12 minutes past now. So I think we can stop here. And, and uh, uh, first of all, we want to thank you profusely for a masterly talk. Why do we talk always during our workshop and conferences, but we never talk about basics. And what we talk basics is the, the fundamental thing to learn uh, gastroenterology and endoscopy. And that was, that was our focus, uh, to focus on the basics uh, of basic skills, basic mindset uh, of uh, a endoscopist. We are not talking about only those who make endoscopy as a career, but endoscopy is a part of every gastroenterologist's life. So everybody who is training in gastroenterology will do endoscopy. So some of them will certainly do advanced endoscopy. And therefore, our talk was focused mainly on basics of endoscopy, which every training gastroenterologist must, must know. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Ajay Kumar, for moderating the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saraswat, for, again, always supporting these kind of activities of ISC. And uh, this has been wonderful to conduct the uh, ISC master classes. Uh, we have two more things to say that uh, uh, we had almost 1500 people logged in today to listen to Dr. Reddy and, and, uh, and it has been a masterly talk. Second thing was that uh, just after uh, this talk, we will release a feedback form where we are asking certain questions, especially on that uh, should we continue this ISC masterclass later on and at what frequency, on which days and what time. So the small question will be sent to you uh, today and please respond to that, which will help us uh, drafting a program, uh, which will... Uh, Ajay, please, can you conclude? I think Govind has, uh, Net has had a problem. It's done now. Uh, you can log off. Yes, so I think uh, we were uh, just telling you about that the feedback form that needs to be opened, and we'll be collecting that. Uh, we request those to get from you. And uh, I think with that, uh, we will come to the end of the session. Uh, okay, Govind. And uh, thank you very much for participation. We can all log off now. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Ajay, Dr. Govind, once again. Thank you.